think so. We, we were just we were just dancing to the funky music on our intro um, thing and trying to pretend it's not just ten in the morning on a Saturday. Uh, well, we should be having brunch somewhere, right? Probably, yes. Yeah, nice sourdough, eggs, spinach. Ooh. Really? <laughs> Marmite, yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so you will uh, probably all know that I'm Laura from Club Soda. I'm a fan mm. of Club Soda. This is Ali. Hi. For those of you who may not have met Ali, Ali's actually one of our volunteer admins in um, Club Soda. Oh, my things are going off. But anyway, um, is, I know, one of our admins in Club Soda. So rather than me doing, and I've done this before, I've done a piece to camera telling you how I changed my drinking. I thought it'd be great for Ali to ask the questions today because then she might ask more complicated questions about my drinking habits, what happened to me, rather than me just giving you my potted version. I'm very good at giving a potted version because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a storyteller. I go straight to the end. Straight to the end, straight to the point. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've been a member of Club Soda since, I think it's five years old. October, it's five years this month. Um, so, yeah. And you and you'll you'll be alcohol free. How long? I'm four and a half years alcohol half free years. now. Actually, I'm I will looking forward to my five year. Looking forward to five year anniversary. Yeah. Um, Ali, Ali's stories in our book actually. So if you haven't seen that book, I used to know exactly what page number it was, but I think I've forgotten. It might be about the two hundred and four mark. Cool. <laughs> possibly. Yeah, possibly. So. I mean, you're coming up nine and a half years now, so it'll be ten years next year. So tell us how it started and, and what was behind you deciding to go alcohol-free. Uh, well, I'm not sure if this was the same for you, but I, I knew I was drinking too much for ages and ages and ages. Mm. And actually, when I was 30, my dad died um, of of alcohol uh, his his liver went his um internal organs went he was never rolling in the gutter drunk although his drinking clearly had gone up in recent years and i just know i'm my father's daughter right i just know it and i just knew that my drinking was very much similar to his very social about being out talking to people um i knew i was drinking too much i enjoyed it too much um, and I did that thing that when you're in a bit of a panic, you do. So this is when I was 30, I went and had a liver test. I went to Booper and had all the tests. <laughs> all of the tests. Um, uh, as a, I decided this would be a wake-up call. And I would go and have all the tests. And I had all the tests and, and? Uh, and they told me my liver was fine, which, of course, I now realise a liver function test generally does tell you because you your liver has to be... You need a liver scan to tell you if your liver's damaged, your liver's functioning, and then tomorrow it could not be functioning, and that's the difference between, I guess, your liver function. But did, did you find that difficult in as much as it's a green light to carry on because there's nothing wrong with you? Um, yes, I, I felt few. I'd had a lucky escape. Yeah. Um, this could have been <clears throat> so much worse. Um, and also, but also I was 30, and though I knew I, I it still felt like I knew I had to give up at some point yeah. but I wasn't ready to give up at that point but the problem actually was is that my drinking went up between 30 and 38 when I gave up drinking mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons really one is I thought uh, I probably knew that at some point I'd have to give up so I was drinking all the alcohol as if somehow it was an in limited supply, like petrol basically yeah yeah I was I, up, I, I was I was continually topping up because I knew at some point it would have to stop deep down. Yeah. And also because I ended up in some unhappy jobs and things that affect my mental health. And I only had one strategy to deal with every emotion from the age of 14, and that, and that was, was drinking. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's quite common. It's certainly something that resonates with my experiences as well. So you you would say your discomfort with the amount you were drinking, you had your happiness with the drinking, and then one was starting, the discomfort was starting to take over. Yeah, I think the discomfort took over um, when I started doing really stupid things with drinking. Like I, I was in a, I was in, uh, I was drinking every other night rather than just um, sporadically during the week. Mm -hmm. I was never able to drink on a hangover. Um, I was also, it felt like because um, uh, I was in a job I didn't enjoy. Yeah, it really. I've always been very identified with the job that I do. It's a real big part of my identity. And to be in a job that I wasn't enjoying, when nobody cared if I turned up, which I have to tell you, everybody, sounds blissful. Oh, look, there's a job. And nobody 
nobody know, cares if you're there or not. I can tell you it absolutely destroyed me. Mm -hmm. and um and it meant i could go drinking at lunchtime it meant i could go drinking in the evening and yeah. and just stay in bed hungover um and it became a bit like i was trying to push the envelope and see who would notice or if anybody noticed and how far i could push it while still basically function it became yeah. feeling like a an extreme sport mm -hmm. um but all the while i was medicating and unhappiness and a feeling of being trapped in something that i didn't want to be in really which sounds like really, really hard work because if you feel that you can't get out of something. Yeah, yeah, and then that's a self-perpetuating cycle, isn't Absolutely. it? Oh, this drug's making me miserable. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just going to drink, but if I carry on drinking, I can't get out of this job, and you end up on that cycle. And I've, I've heard you say quite a number of times now that you were drinking like a dickhead. Um, so my question is, how much of a dickhead will you be? So, uh, yes. Uh, I always describe my drinking as dickhead drinking. Um, so, um, and that's because I wasn't a dependent drinker. I wasn't drinking in the morning. I wasn't drinking every day. But that doesn't somehow make me better than somebody who was mm. drinking every day. Um, uh, we spend a lot of time trying to compare, particularly when we start training our drinking, we like to compare ourselves so we can try and work out, well, at least I wasn't that bad or you go oh shit I must be really bad compared to that person who's here trying to change their drinking as well we spend a lot of time doing comparison which isn't necessarily politi uh, particularly helpful um so I I don't want to explain my drinking as a way for other people to go well that's okay I wasn't drinking that much or uh, oh my god I'm drinking more and therefore there must yeah. be a problem because at the end of the day the problem is in you. If, if it's affecting you, if you're worried about it, if you're here at this festival, then alcohol is affecting you in a way that you're not happy with. And I really think that that's the important thing. But I was, I basically had a really bad hangover every other day. And then the days I didn't have a hangover, I was like, oh, I'm feeling, oh, I'm feeling good now. And I need to treat myself. It's been a stressful day. And I'm happy. I need something to drink. And so I was on this continual cycle of misery 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 with a hangover and then oh let's pep up my mood it was and then um and a that, downward cycle and then an upward cycle so it's, uh, i described my drinking as a bit like this, this strange curvy thing and and then i actually got to the point where at some weekends near the end i ended up drinking the whole weekend that's quite harsh i mean when when you i mean you, you've talked about not having that accountability at work where you can just kind of post along and, and be hungover or go out drinking to then feel that your weekend is like that as well it must have made you feel quite flat yeah there was a weekend where i went the rugby was on in some strange country which meant the pubs were open at 9 a.m and i went to watch with my brother and i had a lovely time watching the rugby with him and we both opened up because we were both drinking um, mm -hmm. a lot. We both opened up about our dad, <laughs> irony. And um, but I didn't really stop that weekend. By the Monday, I was shaking and I was really, really frightened. Yeah, so. and that that's a really difficult thing to to deal with, particularly if you feel like you're struggling with that on your own. Did you find that you found it easy to reach out and find support with your with stopping? No. Um, I think, no, I, I'm surrounded uh, largely by people who drank quite a lot, although my closest mm. friend didn't, but nobody, nobody was telling me anything. Yeah. Um, I knew there was an issue myself. Um, and you know when people talk about rock bottom, I don't believe mm. there's a rock bottom. There's a whole series of things that happen over time that take yeah. you to the place you are. And, and they're, you know, they can be small things like... Um, I always talk about the fact that I went to watch a piece of theatre that I desperately wanted to see, and it was the most amazing piece of theatre I'd ever seen. But I did sit and watch it with a hangover and really, mm. really felt so upset with myself that I had not been able to engage totally with something I'd really wanted to see. And I got a cat about the year before I gave up drinking, which might seem quite insignificant, but the look on that kitten's face when I breathed alcoholic fumes over it Oh, made you feel really guilty um yeah. but also gave me he gave me some companionship and other things as well so um and then you know i there was something else that happened oh yes mm. i broke my ankle on oh, tower well bridge well i don't know how i forgot that and i keep thinking that was quite a long time before i gave up drinking but actually it wasn't that long right. before i did it just before christmas in 20 11 and I gave mm -hmm. up in uh, May 2012 so yeah. actually I keep thinking there was about a year 
Or maybe that was, but it was about six months. Isn't about it? six months, or maybe yeah. I did it the year before. But either way, again, the fact that I didn't, I, I woke up, it was really weird. I woke up this sensation of falling as if I was still in the middle of the fall. Mm. And then thought, oh, that's weird, and stood up and couldn't stand on my leg. And so thought, you'd gone out, broken your ankle whilst you were out, got home, gone to bed, gone to sleep, woke up the next morning, and then realised you'd Oh, no, that's sleep. not all I had done. Okay. I had also got out of a taxi yeah. with probably a broken leg, um, got to the cash point, got back in the taxi. Okay. Or, I, yeah. or I fell getting back into the taxi. God knows. But anyway, um, yeah. and I always, uh, and I don't remember any of that. And I, I also, you know, when you give, you tell yourself all sorts of lies when you're drinking, I used to go, well, at least I don't black out, because to me, black out was passing out. Yeah. <laughs> black out is not remembering things. Right. Shit, I don't ever remember things. So yeah. I was blacking out all the time, yeah. and that was becoming more regular. And um, was that frightening you? Yeah, definitely, that um, sometimes I wondered how I got home safely. Mm. I mean, London, how do you navigate London safely when you're drunk? You just, you just do. You just keep going and keep moving. I don't. But it doesn't make any sense. I know, and I see people who are really drunk on the tube sometimes, and I'm so worried for them. And I'm mm. like, how, how, how did I do this? You know, so often mm. it was, it was really worrying. And then I think the big deciding thing for me was, you know, I really hated the job I was in. It was yeah. definitely killing me in in many different ways. And I'd got to that cycle of thinking that I couldn't. I couldn't change my job until I gave up drinking, which, of course, you're stuck then. Mm. But I managed to persuade um, an organisation um, to give me a secondment. It was ultimately a secondment to close it down. Okay. Um, but it, it was a safe way to get out of, of my job. Mm. Um, the job agreed that I could go on secondment. And um, I ended up working in the arts sector, dealing with people in, in the London arts sector. Yeah. And I was suddenly working in a in an industry that I did enjoy. And although the job was a difficult one, it was very different to being in a job that nobody cared about. Sure. And I was sat in meetings with people running theatres all across London, sat there with a hangover going, what am I doing? I've got this amazing opportunity. This could get me out of a place that I don't want to be. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm sat here worried that I'm stinking of booze. Mm. I can't, this is ridiculous. I can't do that. Yeah. So I made, um, I made a very snap decision actually I got a small bit of tax return and then I decided that's it. I have to deal with this. And yeah. I looked at an online co- a course that I could go to. Um, I decided that despite having like millions of books of Quitlet um, on my shelves that I had never, ever read, right, um, that um, I the, my way of learning is to be in the classroom and to be yeah. with other people. So Thank I would people. have to find uh, a course. Yeah. And the only date I could find was two <clears throat> weeks before my birthday. And I sat there and thought, well, you know, I should drink for my birthday and then give up. And then That's I decided. So though, isn't it? The, the putting it off because there's this to do and there's that to do. Right? Yeah, and the, but I decided... I, I don't know why I did it, but I said that, that no time there was no good time, so I will book the very next one, um, and that's what I did. Okay. It was, a, it was an amazing feat of decision-making for me, which, you know, isn't always that easy. But it, was, it wasn't just you came out of nowhere and thought, right, I'm doing this course. You had those things that you discussed that were going on. So, But I can only see those now in hindsight, in, in reality. Hindsight is always 20 though isn't it we always look back and go yeah but but you know and but it so it may be worth everybody reflecting on on the things that brought you to this course this this Mm. festival and go you know this has been building up for some time this isn't me coming out of nowhere this is a niggling worry that's been here for ages sure and now i'm ready to act so you got to that point you booked the course two weeks before your birthday tell us how that went so i went on the course i um I have to tell you that it made me angry and annoyed me intensely. It was, uh, uh, I, I come from a public sector background, a public service background, and I went to this thing and felt that um, it was incredibly powerful in some ways. The stories around mm. the room first thing in the morning made me realise that I'm not on my own and there's some serious shit going on. Can I just on. ask a quick question? Had you drunk the night before? No, I I decided I, I didn't want to go with a hangover, partly because okay. I had a long journey to do it, but also I wanted to concentrate on not drinking. Okay. So I actually had my last drink on um, Friday, uh, Thursday evening, yeah. I think it was on 
uh, the 11th of November. So I never can quite decide if the 11th or 12th, or whatever is my the last day that I drank uh, or the day that I went on the course. So I don't, it's all a bit floaty. <laughs> I, I have a, a serious disconnection with facts anyways, it's fine. Um, and um, I, uh, I... I don't think that's a good thing to say. No? Yeah, it's like you're, you're doubting me, I'm looking at your No, it makes me sound like I'm the Prime Minister or something as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I don't mean it like that, but I, you know, I, I, I don't worry too much about whether it's so the 11th. So it's the 11th or the 12th, then yeah. Or maybe even the 13th or, or whatever, whatever. whatever. It's the 13th, I think it's the 11th. I think it's the 11th. It's yeah. the 11th. We decided it's the 11th. I had my. I went out. I went to the theatre with a friend. I had a drink afterwards in the pub yeah. um, with them. I got quite drunk. I woke up on the Friday and knew that I couldn't drink again because I was going on this course on yeah. Saturday. I went to the course. I listened to the other stories around the room, which affected me deeply, um, and then continued to be angry for the whole of the course because I had just heard people in the room who... Um, had a real big issue with drinking, yeah. um, as I did. But some people that were dependent drinkers, some people had been told by their doctors if they didn't stop today that they would die and things like that. Mm. And the course was basically just somebody reading out a book of the course in the room and doing a few wow. other little bits and pieces, just doing it in a really nice way, sounding a bit like Simon Bates from Radio 2, um, and then told everyone to go off and not drink again. Um, which actually is wrong. There were people in that room who probably needed to taper sure their thing. drinking. There was no aftercare. And I guess because of my background, I felt that this was um, this was a, a, a unethical, basically. Mm. And I was really angry. But something had also clicked for me, which is that, and I think ultimately... The, the thing that clicked for me was I I had booked a day and put a day aside to mm. change my drinking. When I booked it, I told my friends. So um, you, you had some accountability. I, so I had some accountability. Yeah. I told them I'd booked it. I then proceeded to, after telling them I'd booked it, because it was two weeks away, get completely drunk. Mm. And um, at the party that I told everyone at, um, I also met somebody else in a similar situation to me who, gave, who also said, well, when you give up, I'll give up with you. Mm -hmm. So was those were the helpful? yeah. So those yeah, yeah definitely because there, there were three key key factors. There were three really good behaviour change techniques that I'd accidentally deployed. Yeah. And so actually, the content of the course wasn't as important as spending the day absolutely committed, drawing a line in the sand, mm. spending a day that was committed, telling people that I was doing it, and having somebody else with me to do it. Um, I, I should never underestimate the power of anger to then help motivate me a little bit more. So I came mm. out of that course angry and thinking, right, well, I'm not drinking, but there, there's got to be something better than this. And but so that's I, part of your background, isn't it, as a campaigner and an activist, channeling anger? Yeah, and uh, so I actually spent a lot of time not thinking specifically about my drinking after I gave up, but the process of giving up drinking mm. and what was what people had access to and why there wasn't more and and there became a problem that I wanted to solve and I like solving problems I like finding solutions so that was helpful for me alongside you know being able to get excited about really weird um, herbal teas in particular with the person that I was giving up drinking with and buying a soda stream and getting in loads of syrups from over the mm. world um, the person I gave up drinking with also fell off the wagon several times and it yeah. was bloody hideous really hideous um, for them and that experience that they went through and the disappointment they felt in themselves. Sure. But also I saw them falling off the wagon and I didn't want that to happen to me. I really didn't. Mm. I I felt all the pain of that along with them and, it, and I didn't want to go there. I wonder if that's why I still have drinking dreams where I'm getting people in club soda drunk. Possibly. Because you, you, <laughs> I feel that pain and like, no! to be responsible for it so you had that connection there with that person that you went on the course with did you make other connections with people who were also quitting drinking at the time so did you were there people on the course you stayed in touch with or were there people from outside of that that 
that you made contact with? No, and actually the course was all about not being in contact with anybody else. I suspect That's... the course leaders felt that if you all compared notes, you'd all realise how shit it was and all ask for your money back. Um, <laughs> maybe. I mean, I was thinking more about the, the, the personal connections that, I mean, I certainly found that really important when I was quitting, but I was wondering if that was a similar experience that you'd had. No, it was, it was me and um, my partner who I gave up with mm. um, on, on our own. Um, I didn't connect with other people, but I also didn't stop doing things that I was doing before. I right. mean, I still went to the pub yeah. and got great um, enjoyment out of not drinking and beginning to find interesting things to drink. I'm very lucky that I guess the things that binds me to the friends that I have mm. is more than drinking, um, which is, I, I had politics in common. So mm. there's, there, there was something a bit more. Um, there. So it's the stuff that you would do anyway, but the drinking was the thing that you did kind of on top of that. Because one of my questions was going to be, did you feel your relationship with those people that you used to go drinking with, did they change? Um, definitely, um, mainly because, um, I mean, there's several ways which it changes, I mm. think. One is, is that um, what you want to do in that evening changes. So I was always the last to leave the bar and yes. that just wasn't going to happen anymore. You know, yeah. uh, at 9pm, I was a bit bored of everybody else. And I wanted to go home. And so I did. <clears throat> um, so, so that changed. I also very quickly felt the benefit Question. of energy. Did you find that people behaved any differently towards you as a result of you now going home at nine o'clock did people go oh it's Laura she's going home again she's boring did you find any of that or was that not really a thing no I think the fact that I was a big drinker was so well known in my social circles mm. that probably everyone was quite pleased <laughs> they found Thanks. it a relief fuck Laura isn't still here getting completely wankered and you know and do you um, think it gave other people permission to drink less and go home earlier themselves Potentially, and, and certainly that's happened over time, just by not drinking, I've, I've helped influence other people without the club soda stuff. But I, I think I, I am lucky that, you know, I'm involved in liberal politics, which means generally people are very accepting of the decisions that you make. And so mm -hmm. I, can, I, I, I realise what a privileged position that is to be sure. in. I also feel quite privileged that I'm quite an extroverted person. And so what happened is, is I realised that not being continually hungover gave me a load more energy and it allowed me to be, spend more time being better with people. Mm. And I, I, and I, and so I, I'll always call it like a hundred little epiphanies, right? So I gave up drinking and immediately my energy began to, to increase, not hugely, it still took three months for that to get back into shape. Um, my face got less puffy yeah. um, and suddenly hours in the day opened up so I, I suddenly had a lot more time and I was I was quite intoxicated by that idea of this time and this energy that was suddenly yeah. coming that I could do things and for me that was really exciting it was a feeling that I was really enjoying mm. so in the so in the early days it was easy to carry on because I was I was, I was, and I still am actually, when I go to sleep at night now, quite excited about what tomorrow might bring. Sometimes yeah. I've got a bit of anxiety because I'm really unsure and uncertain and, and things might not be going to plan. But generally, I go to sleep thinking, tomorrow's a new day and I will have the energy to tackle it. Mm. Whereas I used to go to bed and watch TV until I couldn't keep my eyes open anymore. Yeah. Alternating between the fact that, oh, there's more TV left, so I need to get more wine. Or I've got more wine left, so I need to watch more TV, sure. and yeah. then and then go into a slumber where I was really not looking forward to the following day. Yeah. So I was intoxicated by that energy and that that novelty. Well, it, it gives you so much, so much kind of sense of things that, of the possible things that you can do. Because one of the things that I was going to ask is, you talked about how from sort of the age of fourteen, drinking was your go-to for everything, and you've just mentioned sometimes feeling a bit anxious in the evening about what tomorrow might bring. Did you find it quite easy to start adjusting your responses to feelings as you gave up drinking? And how did you start managing things like, for instance, anxiety? Um, so managing feelings um, uh, was interesting. I, I remember I, uh, after this comment, I then did something that I would never have been able to do if I was still drinking, which is I took a job with half the salary that I'd been on. Mm. I am absolutely amazed so that... Didn't need wine money. I, how, how much little, how much less I spent 
on yeah. crap food choices, on all the alcohol that I was spending, that on um, taxes and you know all sorts mm. of stuff. I just took the plunge, and I took I, I felt able to take that plunge because I suddenly felt confident in myself to be able to to deal with whatever um, changing the circumstances would deliver. But that without a doubt, moving away from the job that I was in was the most important thing that I needed mm. to do. So I took a job on half the salary, which didn't come without problems. It was a campaigning job. And I remember one day that I had a really bad day at work. And I remember stomping around the West End thinking, I this is when I'd normally have a gin and tonic. You know, I was having that feeling of yeah. feeling um, uh, not listened to about um, undervalued, um, that things hadn't gone my way um, ill-equipped and probably um a massive bit of imposter syndrome going on I was stomping around the west end or oh, normally I'd go into a bar and have a gin and tonic now but I knew I didn't want to do that I knew that there, there was this just because it was a bad day mm. this wasn't something that I didn't want to then give up um everything that I had gained and so I went into boots and spent ages looking at some ridiculous and and then buying a ridiculous beauty product um, which made me feel altogether better because I had consumed something. I then took it back the next day and got a refund. Well done. Yeah. Um, it was a, it was one of those ridiculous skin tonics that you drink that has um, all of the good antitoxins that red wine has. Perfect. Uh, yes. But in it, and then you'd have a spoonful every day, like I would have a spoonful every day. You know, um, if it's not got alcohol it's in your compulsion to want to drink that stuff, and I don't think it's sold anymore. But anyway, but I, you know, I had dealt with that feeling but all of those things that you've mentioned those feelings that you're having if you could back them up into a ball you just call them discomfort and managing discomfort is a big thing that you've talked about through your time in club soda because it's that discomfort that pushes you towards you know numbing it out i know and away. i i i do amaze myself that i i largely did this without really um having any support mm. um and also without really actually I feel like a real fraud guys right because what I spend my time doing is telling you all that you need to immerse yourself in the subject to learn as much as possible and connect with the community and do all these things and I apart from being able to give up with somebody else which in itself is a form of community so I, I wouldn't dismiss that I I learned it all on the hoof um and it, <laughs> and, isn't and now I want you to not have to learn it on the hoof yeah. but to know that it works because I'm a product of that but, but if you go back 10 years ago they, they're just there weren't the same support networks there I mean there, no it's there, amazing there weren't groups on the internet that you could join around there were some I don't know I'm going back a few years ago, and there's always been AA and I've got the, the hugest amount of respect for people that quit 10 years ago well like Harriet yesterday she celebrated 19 years yeah and that kind of support structure just wasn't there but now if somebody is quitting and you just go to the internet and you google what do I do there's so much more there so it's not like you're a fraud it's that stuff wasn't there. no it wasn't and and a methodology that would work for me wasn't mm. there AA was never going to work for me I have got mm. a a distinct um, aversion to anything that might have a religious um, sense about and I also wouldn't have particularly enjoyed what is basically a very formulaic sense mm. of um, of uh, of a meeting um, it's it's not the way I enjoy engaging with people and I I did consider going to the local drug and alcohol service um, you know I knew where they were I had been you know part of a council leadership team that commissioned them mm. but they kept wanting me to go during the day uh, which actually when I was in a job that no one cared if I turned up wasn't actually a problem but felt like a problem to me because I felt that if it's only available for people that are around during the day it's that's not for me, for me because yeah. that's for people who aren't working who've got a chaotic lifestyle and so despite making a phone call and speaking to somebody mm. I decided it wasn't for me so I there wasn't something that felt right there wasn't anything in the queer community either so um yeah they, they didn't um you know uh there wasn't anything that uh, probably appealed to my overinflated sense of self <laughs> I mean, that's certainly one way to put it. I mean, when when 
No, no, I, I think back to when I first met you, that was just as you were celebrating five years sober. Um, I was celebrating a month. So, I know, I mean, it felt it felt massive. And I was looking at you five years. I mean, but now, what do you think has changed between five years and coming up ten? So we, so in that five years, six years of those have been running mm. Club Soda. Six years since we launched, seven years since I've been working on it, actually. I spent mm. a whole year in business um, development things, uh, projects that, yeah. I, that supported me to set up Club Soda. And a huge amount has happened. If I now wanted, to, I, I would have probably, there are more Facebook groups, for example. Facebook groups are quite new, They're I think. Right. Um, and so I would have looked at Facebook groups and I would have... Um, yeah. I would have gone on Instagram, although I don't particularly like those mediums as a whole. Mm. Um, if I think now, I I look at those things when it comes to running, walking, swimming. Yeah. So I so I do dip into things that are walking, swimming. <laughs> <laughs> I do dip into those things um, that 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 help me connect with communities or find information about what sure. I want. So. I would have certainly have gone there yeah. and it would have really given me a lot of confidence to see people like me, um, people in my age range. So I was in that, um, you know, that ladette generation, that woman now in my late forties who drank far too much mm. wine to be able to see some of that. And that wasn't there before. Um, and so that, that's definitely been a big change. And the fact that people are talking using different language. So, you know, I really appreciate, you know, we use mindful drinking and Ruby Warrington uses so curious. Mm. Um, that language would have worked for me as somebody who feels that this is my journey and my exploration. So it's not about anyone telling me how, what I have to do. It's about um, giving me ideas about how I might want to look at things. And I guess that's where Club Soda comes from as well. We'll always tell you that um, it's, it's up to you to set your goal and decide how you're going to go about this, not that I'm going to tell you what to do. And that's really interesting because that kind of links into my next question. No, don't okay. look at them. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's around moderating because you've been alcohol-free. Has there ever been a point where you thought you might have wanted to moderate or you, you might consider that? And, and you know, what, what is it for you that, that makes makes it work being alcohol free i think um i do sometimes think well, maybe i should try moderation mm. and then the thing that stops me is no i i can't i can't be bothered to go through the mental gymnastics that i would need to go mm. there to be able to keep myself in check when actually there's nothing wrong with my life without alcohol in at the moment sure. anyway yeah. so that's the first thing second thing to say is is that i've always enjoyed but uh so i always carried on going to the pub the, when I gave up drinking and, it, and to be able to go to the pub and come out sober felt like like I did feel like I had a superpower yeah like you ah! just run 100 meters and so uh and I remember going to a cocktail bar with a friend once and he go he was going oh this is an amazing cocktail I said oh give me a try and the look on his face was like oh my god if I give Laura a try of this because this is what the AA mantra is she'll yeah. she'll turn suddenly Monster from this Laura. tiny sip into a raging yeah. alcoholic and probably jump behind a bar and drink from every optic. And I went, no, no, it's absolutely <laughs> fine. I would just be really interested to taste yes. it. Yeah. I tasted it. Actually, it was that interesting. Yeah. <laughs> really tasted it. Oh, yeah. And I tasted it. So, so again, little superpower. Yeah. And then I, I'll now, I always have a boozy dessert, right? I know some people would not go near it, but I, I'd have a boozy dessert and, and know that, you know, I, I, you know, it's added to a dessert, but so I have these little, I guess, these little things that I might, I, I would, the lines that I wouldn't cross, but things that I do. But you like those kind of secret wins that are in there as They well. do, every time it happens, every time I have a boozy de dessert and go away and think, or put alcohol in my cooking or things like that, I go away thinking, oh, <laughs> I can, you know, there's alcohol in this house. They're all, yeah. Somehow there always is, because we end up going to trade shows and you see would always pick mm. up these tiny bottles of rum and they sit here for days and days well weeks and weeks yeah. and potentially years and years because he his drinking is like so sporadic yeah. I then in the end use them in cooking because I'm bored of them taking cake. up and cake and I'm yeah. bored of seeing and I when I rejar all of my pulses I I want to have the tidy cupboard and they are in the yeah. way so that's sure. what happens with those I mean that that 
horror thing happened to me recently when I, I had a bottle of the zero percent Gordon's. I got out of the fridge and I was making a drink. My dad went, "That's Gordon's." I'm like, "No, it's zero. It's mine." And yeah, it's quite strange. I mean, do you think that people's attitudes about non-drinkers, because there used to be quite a lot of, "Oh, you're a non-drinker." Do you think that's changed? Yeah, yes, definitely, because um, suddenly everyone's seeing these drinks mm. that they assume are for non-drinkers, but actually the biggest purchases of alcohol for drinks are people who also drink alcohol. They're mm. using it as a moderation tool. Mm. But people see these drinks and it suddenly creates an acceptability. And I think that's quite important. And, you know, for me, supporting you in your choice to moderate is actually also really important because... A, it's not my business to tell you the goal that you should set for yourself. Mm -hmm. You can only set yourself the goal that you're ready to see yourself in right yeah. now. And I went through lots of attempts to moderate. They were all just involved going, I'm never going to drink again, or I'm going to drink less this week. And it didn't get much further than that. But I'm not sure about you. You must have. Very, very similar things. Yeah. Like, I, I, I should do this. I must do this. But I had no tools. I had no, I had no yeah. way of conceptualizing. So if people come to Club Soda and at the minute they're in the mindset of I need to look at moderating, mm -hmm. then that's fine. I don't want the people to go away because they feel that this is about abstinence only. In the minute A, you fall off the wagon or B, you, you, you've got a slightly different goal. Because most people's goals in Club Soda and the people who are on, on at the festival is a lot more uncertain. I'd rather you were here learning as you went along and then make the decision that's right for you. But that's also partly around the, the language change that we've seen. And we've got grey area drinking and not seeing things as black and white yeah. and good and bad. And there is actually a, a whole place in the middle where it's completely fine to be. Yeah, I always find it difficult that people would say, well, it's your journey, but really abstinence is the only way. <laughs> Um, yes. I, I, without a doubt, I want to save as many of you as possible from the pain that I went through. Mm -hmm. And I would love to tell you that alcohol, and so therefore you should go alcohol free and you should do it immediately. But that's not how that works. Me telling you what to do isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. And I can only share with you my experience and why alcohol free is my preference. Sure. It works for me. Yeah. Um, so if you. And you'd all be pissed off if I drank again, right? <laughs> I've got, you know, I didn't necessarily have much accountability when I first gave up, but you know, there are sixty thousand people now keeping me accountable, and I, you'd all be pissed off, right? Slightly, and like you wouldn't show up to go swimming in the docks and things like that. And you would only be slightly pissed off, would you? A little bit more. <laughs> And if I didn't turn up at the docks as well? Well, I'd just, I just go and have a coffee and I'd be quite dry and warm. Oh. So. <laughs> um, I mean, do, do you think that you've changed as a person as a result of quitting drinking? Or do you think you're still the same, Laura, but better? I certainly, I often tell people that um, I I was always a pain in the arse and uh, mm. now I'm a more effective pain in the arse. So that's more targeted, one thing. possibly. Um, I've got more energy, uh, campaigning takes energy and, mm. and, and that. And I, when I first gave up, I used to say very much that I felt like the person I was when I moved to London when I was 20. Mm -hmm. I still feel that way. I still, the energy that I have is still that energy. Yeah. Um, in my 30s, that's not the energy I had. I had the energy of somebody who was giving up on life. Sure. Um, so, um, so th there's lots that I've refound and regained, um, and my ability to focus and concentrate. Um, uh, I guess I, I know that might sound surprising to you. I wasn't going to say anything about that, I but I do focus it. and concentrate more. Um, but also, um, so, but you know, be able to think through things whenever. When I was hungover, I used to continually park things because I didn't have the brain capacity yeah. to deal with them. And now yeah. I don't park them in the same way. And also I'm getting older. So hard, you know, what, what is about me being sober and what is about me getting older and wiser? Mm -hmm. I guess I wouldn't have got older and wiser in this way if I hadn't have given up drinking. So everything I do now comes from what is basically a solid base of sobriety. Yeah. Yeah. So if you could go back in a TARDIS to... Could I? I mean, it's an oh, it's a big gift. If I know you do, oh, desperately do. But if you could, what would, what's the one key piece of advice you'd take back to 38-year-old Laura? Um, I'd say that uh, you will get to live the life that you want. Mm. Um, you will stop feeling embarrassed and shamed and guilty 
I, I still feel a bit embarrassed and ashamed and guilty about some of the things in my past, but I can live with all of those, you know, ultimately. Um, but I don't spend every day feeling utter dismay at myself. Mm. And that feeling on its own is amazing. And, and also that I would gain all the energy I need to get things done. Um, I think energy is quite important to me in how I perceive my days and getting and getting through days and getting things done mm. um and that all of that would be possible that thing that you thought you could do when you were 20 and that you would be when you grow up is all there you just took a uh an eight nine year break from it and and you know now I'm playing catch up do you feel like you're playing catch up or do you feel like you're in the right place doing the right things that you need to do well it's a mix it's a mix of things I was so sure what I wanted when I was 20 isn't, um, yeah, and nice, isn't it? I know, yeah, and, and with, I know. I'm going to do these things, and then I think I'd rather, rather than my 38 year old self who had yeah. actually made a decision to change something, it's about what I would tell my 22 year old self who moved yeah. to London, yeah. which is that this city is far much easier to manage and enjoy um, if you were able to keep um, alcohol in check. Yeah. Um, but then saying that, I've had some great, you know, that being young in London and drinking in the evenings, you know, there were some amazing times. Mm. And I don't ever want to say that alcohol never had any joy because it did. That's why most of us drink. And yes. um, but but you know, we we all we all want to know when it the line the line would be where we were, where we knew we had to where we really should have stopped. And that, that, that magic line, <laughs> that the line a bit closer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Wouldn't we all like that? And I guess that's, that's that's not the way it works. That's hindsight being useless again. Yeah, yeah. I want hindsight or a TARDIS. I know, but I've I've tried. I've been on the phone to the BBC and they're busy. No, TARDIS is out. Um, so, if there was one thing you could change about about the whole of like alcohol, low and no, where everything is now, if there's one thing that you could immediately change that you think would make the world better around how we conceptualise drinking, how um, drinking is viewed by other people, how not drinking is viewed, if there's one thing that you could change, what would it be? Respect. What are you thinking? Carry on. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, the reason why I say that, and and I guess it it bleeds into everything we do as a society at the moment as well, yeah. which is respecting other people's choices makes it easier for people to keep the things that are good for them. Yeah. Now that might be about um, your um, mental health, and respecting people's difference in mental health or or their difference as a person yeah. or around neurodiversity and all those things. It's respecting people in terms of um, sexual consent and and all of those mm -hmm. sorts of things. They're important too. But if we, uh, but it's it's important to know that that how you treat other people when they're not drinking is part of that same agenda. Because sure. if you're if you're encouraging your work colleagues to drink when they don't want to after work, then you're basically bullying them. Mm. If you're taking the mick out of somebody for not drinking or putting pressure on them to drink, then you are not respecting their choices. Yeah. And then, you know, one of the things, that the nicest things we can do to other people is, is meet who they are and understand who they are and accept people for who they are and how they present to you at whatever point in time that is. So and you made them where they are. And might, where they are. Yeah. That's probably the words I was after. Yeah. And therefore, we should respect that, which also includes, and I think for anyone who's looking to moderate, this is also quite hard because people will see you drink on a Friday and won't understand why you don't want to drink on a Monday. Mm. And, but you were out getting a piss on a Friday night. Why won't you have a drink with me? Because that feels like a personal snub if you're not drinking with me on a Monday night. Uh. And, yes. and you need to say, oh, I see, you're somebody who might drink on a Friday, but today you have decided you don't want to drink, and mm. that's okay. It is by no any way a reflection on our friendship or how you feel about me. Yeah. But it's so tied up in this alcoholcentric society that we have that means that we put a lot of value on consuming alcohol with someone, and it can become a snub. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's partly if that's your outlook and that's your thing that you do, then yeah. if somebody's not going to do that with you, then it feels quite threatening. It's and actually we should go, that's fine, because I still want to spend the evening with you regardless of the strength of the drink mm. in, in your glass. Mm. And if you think about it, that's what it boils down to. There was some, you know, okay, during January and also this October, people have been putting out um, messages that say, you know, 
the hospitality industry is on its knees. Um, so whatever you do, please don't do so for October. And I keep responding to these saying, I still spend loads of money in the pub and I don't drink. Surely you should be saying, please go and visit your pub this October. We've got something for everybody. Absolutely. You're not saying your business only relies on the strength of the drink in your grass. And I know for a fact that, you know, there are lots of big venues around this country now of which alcohol is not the biggest proportion of their takings. Mm. Um, and so that mix, that mix is already very different. But somehow we also have a, a cultural perception that um, that the only thing that makes money in a pub is alcohol and therefore the only way to keep a pub going is for it to, to for you to buy lots of alcohol. Actually, the only way for a pub to survive is for you to spend lots of money, preferably at breakfast, lunchtime and dinner on a Monday and on a Friday, mm. you know. And if that means that you go and do what I do, which is you have a couple of alcohol-free beers and you will have a dessert, whereas the other person next to you might have three alcoholic beers and only a main course, then that's fine. Yeah, because it all equals out yeah, in the end. it does. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got a couple of questions from the community now. Have you? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I have. So this one is from Banjo in Enfield, and he wants to know that do you feel your connections to people... Stop looking at the questions. You're not supposed to get private. All right. Of these. <laughs> I'm do not you looking. feel that your connections to people have changed as a result of quitting drinking? Yeah, when I... Um, I always felt I was a people person, and that's yeah. quite important because um, I was involved in politics from a young age, mm. and I used to go to the pub with um, lots of boys who'd been to private school, and they would know the name of every prime minister from 1800s onwards. And I used to sit in those discussions around deep policy and political history mm. and go, fuck, fuck, I can't do this. I don't know all of this stuff. I can't possibly do politics. Mm. And then I realised how awkward they are when they met um, people in the council estate or had to do casework. And those mm. things were my forte. I could see, I could help people with their problems and I could see how those problems could translate into policy change. And then as my drinking progressed, I began to think that I had been lying to myself about this fact because I would have found sat here now holding yeah. eye contact with you and having a yeah. conversation of full sentences when I was hung over, yes. excruciating. It I'd have been I'd work. have been spending my time thinking, I need to get through today because I've got hang on, I need to get through today, I need to get through yeah. today. And of course, any conversation I had when I was drinking just disappeared into some ether mm. of forgetting. So I, I began to think that I was this this thing that I felt was my thing, the thing that I was good at wasn't um something that was good at at all yeah and so very quickly again it was one of the quick wins that you don't necessarily think about mm. i started having micro interactions with people on the tube i love talking to people on the tube and things like that and they made me really happy yeah. um and i hadn't had those phrases because normally i was just trying to get somewhere trying to get through the day yeah um and so yes i realized that i was a people person and the thing that robbed me of that was alcohol mm. Yeah, that's a really interesting one to hear that that whole improvement is there yeah. because you can, you're not in your internal world of pain. This your head hurts and am I sweating? Do I think of alcohol and how am I going to get to everywhere? So that's a really important one. And then another question is they're all from London at the moment. So this is Dave in Walthamstow and he wants to know if there is any one thing you feel you're better at since you've given up drinking. Um, hmm. there's lots of personal things yeah. so like managing money yeah. um, managing my diet most of the time even when I'm not managing my diet I'm not I'm, man I'm not mismanaging like I did when I was drinking yeah. um, like I haven't had a KFC in nine and a half years which either. is very good yeah, yeah. Um, but may cake but you know but not in the way that I would have eaten when I was hungover but you um, make the cake yes yeah. so sometimes different. Oh yeah, mm. um, and um, and and managing managing my life just generally. Yeah, I feel a lot better at. Yeah. Um, in terms of other things, um, I trust my gut more. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I it's amazing how much trust you lose in yourself when you're drinking because mm -hmm. you feel like you're the worst human on God's earth and you shouldn't be trusted with anything. Yeah, it's taken me a long while to trust my gut. At least of all cats where they've got. To yeah yeah abs yeah absolutely so um so now i trust my gut a lot more mm. um 
and um, otherwise I am as always mostly a jack of all trades and a master of none <laughs> because I've, but I've also learned that that's that's what I do to become yeah. a master it means I might have to read more I'm accepted that you, I, I think you have to read 10,000 hours worth of material to become master whereas I'm you know I've admit I just have to admit to myself that I prefer audio books and podcasts and that's where that's going to be fair enough fair enough so, I mean, one thing that you did mention earlier was about running and swimming and stuff. I mean, you didn't do that before. No, I definitely didn't do anything active. So I'm yeah. definitely better at doing things active. And mm. soon I hope to be consistent at those. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that I am. One day. There's, there's, there's things to yeah. move towards. So, and then Ian wants to know if there's going to be a 10-year party. Oh, because we talked about the five-year party. Will there be a 10-year party? We should do it as part of a festival, really. Yeah. I wanted to be able to do a real-world festival next year. So, Which, yeah, that would um, be amazing. So we could do that yeah. probably in June or July. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, let's do it. Okay. And then just this is the final question. What's next for you personally? What is your next thing that you've got your site set on? I don't know. What? We've talked about all this optimism and this positivity and all the things you can do. Mm, I don't know. Okay, what's next for Cough Soda? Um, I'm hoping we do something exciting in January, so you need to look out for that. Let me think about the personal one. I don't know, really. I'm in a, a space of change, yeah. and so I'm thinking about change, mm. but I don't quite know what the final form of that will take. Mm. But, you know, not watch being... Watch this space. Watch this space, definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali, and I hope you enjoyed that. And please ask any other questions. Um, if you're in the Festival Telegram uh, channel, then um, connect with me there. And this video is available for everyone to watch as often as you need to. I won't watch it that often. Maybe fast forward through some bits. <laughs> I mean, I'll do that, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank all. you. Bye.